my dear brothers and sisters assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh it's a great pleasure and honor to be here <coughs> in scotland and in glasgow and uh, i am very grateful to you for this opportunity to meet all of you and inshallah hopefully share some thoughts with you which i hope will be beneficial the way the presentation is organized is i will speak to you broadly about what i see as the key issues to address with respect to education in this 21st century and these issues are common whether we are looking at islamic education or we are looking at um, for want of a better word secular education or for what should ideally be the case which is integrated education of the two so these issues are common how many of you have seen uh, there's this uh, wonderful uh, drama play called the mouse trap which is the longest running play in the history of uh, of drama as far as i know how many of you have seen the mouse trap anybody no you have seen it okay those of you who haven't seen it should see it it's a wonderful play the reason i'm using that play is because of a strange thing and that strange thing is that this play has been running as far as i know for now over maybe 35 40 years but the ending is always the same now isn't that strange you know, how is the ending always the same because actors have have come and gone obviously because the the, the people who acted in the in mouse trap on the first day when it opened uh, obviously the same people many of them have even died i mean they have not even they are not even alive anymore but the ending is the same that does it sound like it's a strange thing is, is that is my comment uh, strange or does it make sense but that's exactly our situation our situation as people is that we want to have different endings while doing the same things and that's not possible so if you want a play to have a different ending then you have to change the script not the actors so if you want a play to have a different ending we must be prepared to change the script not just to change the actors and i think that's an important thing to keep in mind and that's why i'm saying if you want a different ending change the change the script now as i said i am relating this both to for want of a better word i don't like the word secular education because i don't think there's anything called secular education uh, all ilm and all knowledge is from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalalu whether it's physics or chemistry or whether it is hadith or quran is all from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and therefore to call something secular as in meaning free from god uh doesn't make sense but anyway since we have that as a common usage term which we all understand the purpose of all education especially islamic education is to form humans i'm not saying create humans because the creator is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but form humans because animals are born humans are made we are as you know biologically speaking all of us are mammals and uh young children when they are born there is a lot of similarity between the young of human beings and the young of sheep and the young of cattle and so on they all they all drink milk and they all cry and they all you know do various things the key thing if you want that young of a mammal to become human is through education that's how education happens so i'm saying animals are born humans are made and it's the purpose of education to form humans our society is, uh, i want to quickly do a scan of uh, what kind of society we live in and when i say society i don't mean necessarily the west uh, i say many times today that west is no, no longer a direction west is no longer uh, you know one 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 part of the world the west today is ideology the west is everywhere there is only one direction which is west whether you are living in pakistan or india or saudi arabia or wherever the west is what is there in our minds so the west is not a direction it's up here our society very strangely and i'm saying strangely because uh, it's we consider ourselves and we seem to take a lot of pride in uh, saying and in perhaps pretending that we are the most educated people that ever lived generally speaking we have this uh, we have this belief about ourselves that our level of knowledge and understanding Uh, is the highest that the human race has ever achieved this is what we like to believe i personally don't think that is true but anyway i mean at least to gen- generally speaking that's what people like to believe now 
strangely, however, our society is characterized by anxiety and fear. Uh, largest selling drug in the, in the US is uh, Prozac, which is an antidepressant drug. Um, we are characterized by distrust and insecurity to the extent that uh, by, by law in most western countries, a teacher is not permitted to comfort a child who is crying by hugging the child. You are not supposed to touch the child. The child can cry itself to death. You are not supposed to touch the child. Why? Because this is the extreme of uh, a concern for uh, security and therefore it is based on distrust. And all of this in the midst of wealth. Now, I am sure this one everyone will agree. When I was growing up uh, in the 50s and 60s, the amount of uh, disposable income that we had, the amount of money, free money to use at home and so on in our countries was not even a fraction of what there is today. I mean, today, um, if you look at it, people at a much lower economic level have a much higher, uh, you know, standard of living. And this is, in the West is even more true. So, even though we have a lot of uh, disposable income, but our lives are characterized by insecurity, by fear, by anxiety and by distrust. Number two, our virtues. What do we teach? Uh, I teach in several business schools in the world and uh, to use, uh, not a very nice term, but that's what uh, is generally used. We teach competition. We teach competition. We say, what is the secret of business? Kill your competition. I mean, these are the terms, terminology that we use. So, basically what is called a dog eat dog mentality. Right? We talk about the rat race. As somebody said, uh, the problem with the rat race is that even if you win the race, you are still a rat. So, the, <laughs> the, 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 uh, you know, these are the issues. Very aggressive stances. Uh, grab things. You know, take this, take that. Uh, grab market share. Not persuade customers to buy. Grab market share. Whether the customer likes it or not, I must grab the customer's attention and then uh, access to the customer's pocket. Uh, and a lot of hypocrisy. A lot of we don't like to we don't like to use the term, but that's that's our society is characterized by a lot of hypocrisy. Our society is based on the on consumerism, and what is consumerism? Consumerism is to take something which is a want and convert it into a need. I'm sure many of you have uh, this issue, and you must have heard this, especially from the younger ones. And you say, Daddy, I'm, I I need a PlayStation. Excuse me. You, Nobody needs a PlayStation. You know, you might want a PlayStation, which is bad enough, but you can't say you need a PlayStation. Nobody needs a PlayStation. But that's the whole thing. Convert want into need. And people are very, very clear. I, I still remember several years ago, I was uh, in South Africa and uh, I read a headline in a marketing uh, business newspaper. And guess what the headline said? The headline said, miss a beat and you lose a generation miss a beat and you lose a generation. Now, do you think they were talking about uh, lose a generation spiritually or morally? This is a business newspaper. They are talking about lose a generation materially. They know that these little ones there who are 8 years old, 5 years old, 6 years old, 2 years and 3 years old have more buying power than you have because they can actually compel you to buy things that you would not have bought otherwise. So, the, 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 the whole focus of marketing very strangely and of marketing of, of everything from cigarettes downwards. I mean, think about that. Their, their marketing from cigarettes downwards is focused at the youngest children that we have. So, our society is based on hypocrisy. We, we take wants and convert them into needs. Our success in life is measured by buying things we do not need to show people we do not like and pay for that for the rest of our lives and leave them behind when we die. This is, our, this is my definition of our modern society. We buy things we do not need to show people we do not like and pay for that for the rest of our lives and then we leave that behind when we die. I mean, this is a strange kind of world we live in, but that is the world that we have created. Our blind spots, on the other hand, are mutual responsibility, compassion and accountability. Very, very seldom do you find these things in our society. Just yesterday, somebody sent me an email 
which had picture, the, the, the heading of the email was, what has our world come to? And it had pictures of parking lots of car manufacturers in the US and the UK. Thousands of cars, literally thousands of cars all parked, nobody buying them. And when they asked them why are all these new cars parked, they said because people nowadays prefer to buy second hand used cars, they don't want to buy new cars, so the sale of new cars has gone down. So you have got new cars which are, which are sitting in the parking lots and rotting literally. Now that is our society. So, I, so this friend of mine said, what is the solution? So I said, this what you are seeing uh, is the result of capitalism, but we know that communism and socialism is not the answer to capitalism. So he said, what is the answer? I said, responsibilism. So I, I coined that term and I suggest that you start using that term, responsibilism, living responsibly. Very interesting. Um, as we know, a couple of years back when we had the financial crisis in the West, uh, what triggered it was the housing loan crisis, the, what is called the subprime crisis. Now, the subprime crisis as a consequence of that, many, many, many people in the United States, they lost their homes, literally on the streets, so living in caravan parks and living on the street. But interesting survey that was done, that survey said that the number of empty houses in the United States is enough to give each homeless person three houses, not one, three houses. Can you imagine? I mean, that number of empty houses are there, but people are not permitted to live in them because the bank owns the house. And you, since you didn't pay the bank, you have to live on the street. The empty house is allowed to be there and fall apart, but it will not be occupied by people and people are living on the street. This is our world. Compassion, zero. Accountability, zero. Or at least we think it is zero and mutual responsibility does not exist. My submission to you, my brothers and sisters, is that we are very sick. We are an extremely sick society. What is our situation today? Snapshot of today. If I take a photograph of our society today, one is surfeit of information, huge amounts of information. Take Islamic knowledge for example. There was a time when I was studying, if you wanted to learn Islam, you had to go and join a madrasa. Or you had to go and sit with the sheikh and he would explain things to you. But before he explained things to you, you had to reach some level of knowledge even to be able to understand the istilahat of the sharia because obviously you cannot understand technical, uh, technical explanations if you don't know the technical knowledge. So it took you a lot of time. Today you go to sheikh Google and in one second you have all the siyasita, all the books of hadith, three, four translations of the Quran and you are free to pick from it what you want and make of it what you want. And obviously, most of the time that is wrong, that is nonsense because we don't have the ability to extract that knowledge from the uh, sum total of knowledge that is coming to us. Surfeit of information. Similarly, the same thing applies to uh, knowledge which is not Islamic, which is all kinds of knowledge. We have all forms of gadgets that are, uh, that you can imagine, which are available to us. We have got websites, we have got all sorts of things, lots of information, but very little knowledge. We have confused information with knowledge. Malumat or ilm do ek cheez nahi hai. Malumat alag cheez hoti hai, ilm alag cheez hoti. So the, the knowledge is ilm and malumat is information. We have confused information to mean knowledge. Second one is we have a surfeit of tools. We have all kinds of tools. You got people running motivation programs. You got people who are running team building programs. You got somebody doing seven habits. You got somebody doing, doing 19 habits. You got all sorts of things. But very few or paucity or absence of criteria for decision making. Our decision making criteria are seriously flawed. Our decision making, I'll give, I'll give an example. I used to be on the uh, selection board of the scholarship program for the Islamic Development Bank out of Jeddah. And this program, we had one of the things that we gave scholarships for. We would give a full 100% scholarship for people going into pure sciences. I'm not talking about Islam, I'm talking about pure sciences. Somebody wants to do maths, he wants to become a PhD in mathematics, someone wants to become a PhD in physics, in chemistry. The Islamic Development Bank would give them full scholarship. We said, let us nurture the talent of Muslim students, identify them and so on. Believe me, I was on the border there for five years. For five years, that quota we could never fill. And guess why? Standard answer, you, don't, you, you can't make money as a scientist. 
You don't starve as a scientist, but you can't make money as a scientist. So what does everyone want to do? Everyone wants to become a computer mechanic. I'm sorry, there are some friends of mine here who are computer mechanics. So, I mean, they, they should not be offended with that. Right? IT specialist. What's that? Computer mechanic. So, the point is, why? Because there are jobs in that line. But my point is, unless somebody is interested and willing to go into the basis of the information, the foundation of knowledge, how will the boundaries of knowledge expand? Our single criteria for anything is, how much money will it make? Now, this is uh, completely and totally unacceptable. My, I must make one request to the brother. If you are photographing the ladies, please don't do that. If, you, if this is my video, then I don't want any women, women pictures in that. Huh? So, the, the um, key thing is paucity of criteria. Third one is, as I said, we have a uh, lot of wealth, but paucity of awareness, what to do with this wealth. How can I make this wealth into a resource in my akhira? Who needs the wealth? What can I do with it? All we can do with money is spend it and that's what we do. But the problem with wealth is that the wealth only benefits the wise. I'll give you a very simple example, live example. There is something called the ISS, International Space Station. International Space Station is a collaborative effort of uh, 15 different countries including the United States and Russia um, and many other countries and some of them are very small countries and this is a space station which is uh, in space obviously uh, <laughs> and uh, it's uh, they're doing a lot of research with regard to space and all kinds of research very very interesting research now it's available on, if, you, if you go to uh, on, on the internet you have all that one on a side note the International Space Station orbits the earth at a speed of 7.62 uh, miles per second. That means that it does 16 orbits per day. So the people on the International Space Station, they see 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets every day. They asked them, they said, what is the most beautiful thing? What is the most beautiful part of your experience on the International Space Station? They said, watching sunrises and sunsets. But guess what? There is not a single person on that International Space Station who will see a sunrise and say, Subhanallah. Not one. Not even one. And that's not because we don't have the money. Nothing to do with money. There are countries which are participating in the International Space Station. My grandfather's Jagir was bigger than that country. Seriously. I mean, <laughs> Focus. Focus, lack of, serious lack of wisdom. Future generations, my brothers and sisters, I, I sometimes imagine, you know, the, you know the archaeological sites, people go and dig up some mound and, uh, oh, Pakistan, Mohanjadaro, Harappa, uh, what kind of a city there was. And, so I think future generations will come and dig up our mounds and they will wonder how people with so much knowledge could not prevent their own destruction but actually accelerated it. Tell me what about global warming do we not know? But global warming is accelerating or decelerating? Which is, what's happening? What about environmental pollution do we not know? But what's happening to the environment? And I can go on, I, I don't want to waste your time. I mean, I, you can make your own list. We have all the knowledge, but we make no use of it. So I'm saying that we do not have the excuse of ignorance and we do not have the excuse of poverty. Somebody told me the other day that, you know, we have uh, the arms stockpile of uh, powerful nations is enough to destroy the world 40 times. So I said that's a completely oxymoronic statement because after you've destroyed it once, how can you destroy it another 39 times? I mean, it <laughs> makes absolutely no sense, right? But people say, so this is our world. So I'm saying when people dig up this world, they're going to wonder how is it that people had so much of knowledge but they could not even prevent their own destruction. But I guess we can say that we were stupid. Now, please consider this. Who do we pay more? Teachers or film actors and pop stars and music, uh, you know, singers? And who do we pay more? Guess what would happen to the quality of education if you flipped that? If you paid my brother here, 
Alim Sheikh, who is a head teacher in uh, Harrow Primary in London, if you paid him what Salman Khan makes, and if you paid Salman Khan what he makes, Salman Khan will become a teacher, right? <laughs> instead of, instead of, the, see, you know, I, I always say you, you, you get what you pay for, right? You get what you pay for. Now, just ask this question, and this may look like it's crazy, but I'm saying we are the ones who made this world. We are the ones who made a world, and just, just think about this. Why is it that we need to pay entertainers and film actors and uh, movie producers and, and music people so much of money? You know why? Because we have created a society and we have created life which by itself is so stressful and it is so disgusting. And it is so pulling down and depressing. Sorry to, sorry to depress you today. But I'm saying it is so bad that we actually need to take time out to forget ourselves. So you go into a movie theater, you sit there for three hours and you forget the world. You forget all your problems. Your problems are still there. When you come out of the movie, the movie theater, you still got the same house and you still got the, the same problems and you still got the same debts and everything else. Nothing has changed. But for the three hours, you, you forget it. So your stress level goes down. Now imagine what kind of life is that? When I used to live in America, somebody one day they told me, they said, uh, you know, we have a problem in the West, which is that uh, for our children, there is no halal entertainment because, uh, you know, all these movies and so on is not halal. So what was the entertainment of the Sahaba? So they said, you have, you, you, you read the seerah and so on. So from the seerah and the seerah of the Sahaba, uh, what was the entertainment of the Sahaba? You know, you know what, I, what I discovered and I'm sure all of you know this. Three things. Archery, running and horse riding. Then I thought to myself, why these three things? Big answer, these three things are actually military training. This is physical fitness, not entertainment. So, what was the entertainment of the Sahaba? Nothing. Zero. Now, you might say, what kind of a dull, boring life that was. But it wasn't. You know what? They had the most interesting life because these people were focused on a goal. For a purpose, for a person who is living a purposeful life, who is focused on a goal, there is no stress. And there is no need to forget anything because he is in it, he loves it. And he is achieving something, so he is getting this huge sense of, of achievement. And he, needs, he does not have to forget anything. He does not need anything which today we understand as entertainment. What was the entertainment of Nabi Sallam? He used to say, Ya Bilal, call the Adhan. His entertainment was Salah. To be with his Rabb Jalla Jalaluhu. He used to say, Salah is the coolness of my eyes. Today for us, may Allah forgive us. I am speaking about myself. For us, Salah is a burden to be dumped. The one who is not praying is not praying. I am talking about the one who is praying. I have to finish my Salah. Finish the Salah. We finish the Quran. Inna lillahi wa inna lillahi rajun. Sab chiz ko am khatam karna hai bitu lehu hai. Sab khatam. Namaz bhi khatam karo. Quran bhi khatam karo. Saad lege kuch chalna nahi. Sab chhod ke jana hai. So, we pay, who do we pay more? How do we define success? Moral or material? How many parents, and please don't, don't be offended if I tell you, how many parents today will lose sleep, will feel ashamed, will be stressed out because their son or their daughter cannot lead Salatul Fajr in a masjid properly? And why am I saying Salatul Fajr? Because you can't get away with Khulu Allah Wahad. You must know at least, you know, even if you don't recite 30 ayat or 40 ayat, maybe at least 20 ayat or something. How many parents lose sleep over the fact that my son or my daughter cannot read Suratul Fatiha, which is a rukun of Salah, with proper tajweed? But the same parents, if that son or daughter fails in the metric exam or something, oh my God, there, is, there will be chaos. There will be chaos. So what is our, what is our, our basis of uh, defining success? Moral or material? What do we focus more on? Knowing or doing? Today there is a, 
big trend in Islamic courses. I don't know if they happen here in this place, but uh, almost everywhere in the world. There are these uh, internet uh, based companies and Islamic courses. People come and run weekend courses and so on and so on. And very strangely, I, I, one thing I noticed is that any of these um, companies, because they are companies, uh, who come to a city to run a course, the first course they run is a course on jinn. And I, <laughs> I said, yeah, yeah, jinnat se kaya, itni mohabbat hai kaya, pahela course jinn. Because that attracts the maximum number of people. You know, people want to know about jinn. So, tawheed is not important, risalat is not important, akhirat is not important, all boring stuff. We don't want to worry about that. But jinn, because you attract the maximum number of people in jinn, so maximum number of tickets, you make the maximum number of money. May Allah forgive us, Islam is free. Islam is not a business, keep it free. Don't make money out of the deen. Vakar ke Islam ke deen ke Allah ke kitab ho, Allah ke nabi ke sunnat ke sunnat ke vakar ke khilaf hai. At least that's what we were taught. So point is knowing. So people go and I, I call some of my friends professional course attenders. So they go to this course and this course and this course and this course and they come back with binder after binder. They pile up all the binders in their, in their house and alhamdulillah I attended the course on usul al-fiqh. Oh my, mashallah, I mean may Allah protect you, you are, don't even know how to read the Surah Al-Fatiha with Tajweed and you have attended a course of Usul Al-Fiqh. Because somebody is teaching Usul Al-Fiqh. So I, okay, then what are the Usul Al-Fiqh? I have no clue, I, I have a binder, I will show you, you know, please read it. So knowledge, acquiring of information, not action. But guess what, what is Allah going to ask us? Is Allah going to ask us what did you know or will He say what did you do? Sawal to amal ka hai. And the last one, what do we spend more on? On ourselves or on others? On short term or long term? Long term is the akhir. Where do we spend more on? Even those people, Alhamdulillah, this, this Ummah is blessed with people who are very charitable, mashallah. We probably collectively as people, the Muslims give more money in charity than Wallah Alam, maybe other people. But individually, if you look at it, if I want to buy myself a phone, I have no problem spending uh, you know, 500 pounds or something on a phone, that's probably what it costs, a, a, a good smartphone. But if this masjid needs money, how many people will, will put 500 pounds into the bag? So, we get what we pay for. Ask yourself, why is it that we spend more on arms than on medical research? We spend more on death than on life. How do we, we know that pornography corrupts, but why is it that pornography is not made illegal? Can be done. Why is it not, I'm not saying it's, it's your responsibility, you don't have that power, but you vote for those who have the power. Why is pornography not, why is it not made an election uh, issue? You know it corrupts. We know alcohol is a drug, but we promote it. Alcohol is a drug, marijuana is also a drug, and LSD is also a drug, and heroin is also a drug, but we say heroin and, and, and LSD is haram, within quotes, so it is illegal. Marijuana, there is now, an, a, a, I don't know if you are aware, but there is a, 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 a campaign now to make marijuana legal, and alcohol has always been legal. And we know it destroys families. We know, I'm not even talking about the Islamic part of it. I'm saying, catch anyone on the street and say, alcohol, is it good for you? No one is going to say that. Even the one who drinks will not say it is good for me. I, he might say, I like it, but he's not going to say it's good for me. And then we are very surprised at the society that we created. And this is the result of having one aspiration, which is to make money, no matter how. So therefore ask yourself this question, how can we get contentment when our progress is based on discontent? I just, I just explained to you the materialistic system that we operate on. It's based on discontent. Maximum, create the maximum, how do you create a market? By creating discontent. That's the only way you know how, how to create a market. So how can you have contentment when progress is based on discontent? How can we get peace? when our progress is based on greed? How can we get contribution when our progress is based on consumption? Possessions add cost, not value. We buy this, we buy this, we buy that. Most of us do this as an exercise. 
go back home and when you go back home just look at and tell your family what are the things that we have in our house which we have not used for the past six months you will be surprised at the amount of stuff that you will be able to create that you have not even used you bought it it's lying there and then next exercise take all that stuff and donate it give it away uh, at least Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you. Let me see how many of you do that. Uh, we keep it there, but they don't have to recognize it. And that's why I'm saying when dissatisfaction is the motivation, depression is the result. And that's why we sell Prozac. My brothers and sisters, invest in assets. Education is an asset. Don't invest in toys. Today, if you want to raise 10 million pounds to build a masjid, you can do that. I can even put a time on it within this period. But if you want to, in, if you want to raise 10 million to build a world class school, people will look at you like you're mad or what. I just came, I came here actually to Scotland to go to Inverness to see Gordonston School, which is absolutely a fantastic, great world class school. Prince Charles went there, his son went there. Uh, Princess Royal Margaret went there, her daughter Zara went there. It's a beautiful, beautiful school. Big question for you and me. Why do we not have a Muslim school of the quality of Gordonston? For a very simple reason. Five letter word. M-O-N-E-Y. Not that we don't have it, but because we don't believe in investing it in education. We invest it in uh, private aircrafts and we invest it in palaces and we invest it in all kinds of stuff, including extremely ostentatious masajid. But we will not invest it in things which have the power to change the destiny of this ummah going forward. May Allah protect us. You know, somebody, one of the great physicists, he said, give me a lever and I will move the world. I will move the earth. Principle of leverage is not the lever, it is to know where to place the fulcrum. The closer it is to the load, the less weight you have to put. And that's what I want to talk to you now. Now, education, therefore, must transform an animal into a human being. The purpose of education is to civilize and the purpose of civilization is to enable you to do that which doesn't come naturally. If I get angry, to shout at you comes naturally. Not to shout is education. To hit somebody is natural. Not to do that is education. And so on and so on. And very many, many times to do what comes naturally and spontaneously is to revert to our original animal state. And education therefore differentiates. Why differentiate? Because the secret of success is branding. Differentiation creates brand. Brand inspires loyalty. Without brand, you are a grain of rice in a sack. You are still rice, but you are one grain in a sack. This is what I teach people when I am teaching them marketing, when I am teaching them career progress. Brand yourself. Don't say I am an IT engineer. There are zillions like you. Who cares? What in IT can you do which others can't do? That is brand. What is your brand? What is it that makes you unique? What is the memory that people will take away when they, when they leave you? And that's my question. That is what education is supposed to do. So what is your brand? What is my brand? What is our brand as Muslims? Ask yourself this question. Why brand? Because those who stand out are honored. Those who blend in are sheep. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us to stand out. To be beneficial to people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Kuntum khaira ummatin, ukhrijat minan nas or lin nas? Lin nas. If I say, Kuntum khaira ummatin, ukhrijat minan nas, sentence is grammatically correct, but that is not the ayat of the Quran. If Allah said, You have been sent and you have been, you are the best of people and you have been extracted from the people. Allah did not say that. He said, you have been extracted for the people, for the benefit of people. Linnas, not minanas. 
And so the question I always ask is, if Muslims and all signs of Muslims are wiped off from the face of the earth, may Allah protect this Ummah and inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect this Ummah. But just imagine that tomorrow morning we wake up and find there are no Muslims anymore and no signs of Islam anymore. What will be lost for the world? What do you think the others will say? Will they say, oh my God, where did they go? These are good people, they are beneficial to us. How can we exist without them? What will happen? To, will they say that? I don't want to say what I think they will say. So what to do now? Three priorities and I am going to end very quickly. Number one, we have to teach three things. Number one, teach who you are. Very important to teach people their identity which is based on an honorable legacy. We are Muslims. We are not Muslims because we are Pakistani or Indian or Somali or Sudani. We are Muslims because we, we worship only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Inna hadhi ummatukum ummatan wahidan wa ana rabbukum fa'abudu. So we are Muslims because we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalla So who are we? Believe me, many times people ask me, society is so corrupt and so on, how can we protect our children? I, I tell them, give them a sense of identity. Who you are? Who are you? You are not any ordinary piece of trash that runs around in the world. You are a very special person because you are a Muslim. Therefore, your walking, your talking, your speaking, your behavior has to reflect Islam. What does that mean? This is what we need to teach them from the, from the youngest age. I was reading the uh, brochure of uh, Harrow, <coughs> which is, uh, you know, one of the top schools in, this, in, in uh, I, should, I don't know if I should say this country, because if you vote now and say you are an independent country, then it's uh, in your neighboring country, right? Uh, so, <laughs> the point is that at least not, just now I can say this country because it's, it's one country. Very interesting uh, note in that brochure. There's a picture of uh, Harrow boys uh, in the Harrow town. And you know, they wear, the, they wear those uh, flat uh, yellow hats. So, it says, uh, in, it's written there, it says that uh, our boys, you will find our boys in the town uh, wearing our yellow hats, those, those flat hats which we like very much. They will be distinguished by the courtesy with which they treat each other. They will be distinguished by the courtesy that they treat other people. Imagine a school that has the confidence to write that in their prospectus, in their brochure. I ask myself, do I have the confidence to go out in the world and say, you want to know who are the Muslims? Look at people who are treating each other with consideration. They are Muslims. Not because of their beard, not because of their, of their headgear, not because of, of women who are wearing hijab, but because all of these are important. Alhamdulillah, all of these are fard. So, let, don't take this uh, to mean that, you know, it is okay to shave your beard, it's not. But the point I'm saying is that, do we have the confidence to say that our children will be distinguished by their manners? And I'm sure many of us, and Hadat will agree with me, there was a time when our children were distinguished because of their manners. Others used to say, Musamana ke bachchon ka bade achcha, tehzi bade achcha hoti hai, bade achcha akhlaak hoti hai. Hey, bolta tha nahi loog. Harrow students, it's part of their, of their uh, brochure. Teach them why do they exist, what is your responsibility, why are you there in the world. You are not there, you are not there just to make money, you are not there just to buy things. You are there for a purpose, what is that purpose? Teach them that and teach them that we are accountable and that we are answerable. And what are the things that we are answerable for? We may like to live as if we are not accountable, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. If we lived, we will die. And when we die, we will be resurrected before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalla lo, and we will answer. My brothers and sisters, teach three, then show three. Number one, show them to understand themselves, how to do that. Because unless you understand yourself, you cannot understand the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the aqwal of Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib anhu, he said, Araftu rabbi bi fatqil adayim. He said, I understood my rabb by the breaking of my aims in life. 
थ्रू माय ओन फेलियर्स आई अंडरस्टूड माय रब अल्लाह अल्लाह सुबहान व तआला जल्ला जलाल मे अल्लाह गिव ग्रांट यू ऑल सक्सेस बट हु इज ए हु इज ए फुली राउंडेड हु इज ए कॉन्फिडेंट पर्सन एंड पीपल कॉल हिम मुश्किल कुशा एंड पीपल कॉल हिम मुश्किल हु इज अ कॉन्फिडेंट पर्सन अ कॉन्फिडेंट पर्सन इज and i'm quoting now gordonston uh, brochure a young person who is comfortable with himself and who is equally unaffected by success or failure and yeah, this looks like uh, it's come out of one of our uh, kitabs of uh, suluk or something eh? <laughs> I don't know what happened. I mean, they, they, every, everyone has taken our things and they are using it, and we we are lost. May Allah protect us. So, teach them that. Number two, relationships. How to deal with people? How to be with the youngsters, young people? How to do be with the old people? Famous story from the Sira, which many of you would have heard. There was a young boy, a young Jewish boy, who used to hang out with Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He used to be around the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He would do various things and run around and so on. and for one time nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam didn't see him for two or three days so he asked the people he said where is this boy they said ya rasulullah he is very sick and maybe he will die so rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said take me to him so they went to his house and there rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he found his boy was lying on his bed he was clearly in his last moments of his life his father was standing by the side of his bed nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam went and sat down by the side of the boy and he held his hand and he said say qulu la ilaha illallah tuflihu he said say la ilaha illallah muhammadur rasulullah and become successful and enter islam this boy now imagine he he has the hand of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in his hand and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is saying accept islam the boy is in his last moments of his life he looks at his father His father is a Jewish person. The boy is a Jewish person. The boy looks at his father. The father says, "Do what Abul Qasim is telling you to do." He said, "Do what Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is telling you to do." The father tells him, "Accept Islam." The boy accepts Islam and he and he and he dies. How does this happen? Tell me. How does this happen? Who is this boy? Some unknown young Jewish boy. I mean, what is he to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? So, what is this relationship building that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did? What was the relationship? Now, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you read the Sira, one of the Sahaba says, and this is in the in the in the in the section of the Sira which relates to the conditions in which Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam received wahi. And one of the Sahaba, he says, and Wallahu Alam, I think it is Abdullah bin Masood or Dalal Anu, but I'm not sure what the name. But one of them, he said that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was lying down with his blessed head in my lap. his head was on my thigh when he received wahi and he said the weight was such that i felt my leg would break now leave the wahi part of it think about this here is the who is nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam he is lying down with his head in the lap of one of his companions what kind of closeness what kind of mohabbat what kind of heart to heart relationship i mean we don't have this so where did it go third one teach them science how to deal with natural laws gravity is a law of allah subhanahu wa taala jalla jalalu make no mistake newton discovered it he didn't make it allah made it Aerodynamics is a law of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala Jalla Jalalu, and I can go on ad infinitum. Teach them science from the perspective of the kalam of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, from the perspective of the Sunnah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Don't teach them science as if there is no God. This is our problem. We have fractured education. We teach the kalam of Allah as if there is no creation, and we teach the creation as if there is no Allah. I was in one of the Alhamdulillah Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala has given me the uh, privilege and, and honor of knowing many ulama and being uh, friends with many ulama. So uh, one day I was in one madrasa in uh, Hyderabad, and uh, I was uh, so uh, I went into the uh, Darul Tahfiz. So the Ustad of Hifz uh, he told me he called me inside. He said, "Ah, boy, कोई बच्चे का कुछ सुनिए." So I sat there. One of the boys came and I said, "Boy, सुनाओ." So he started uh, reciting. and he came to this ayah where allah subhanahu wa taala said qul siru fil ardi fanduru kayfa badal khalq 
Allah said, go around in the world and see how we have created things. So from where we were sitting, looking out through the door, was the yard. And in the yard, there were some chickens which were grazing. So I told the boy, I said, stop, he stopped. I said, uh, look outside there. So he looked. I said, what do you understand about this ayah from looking at the chickens? So now this poor boy, I mean, imagine his, his, his fate, he gets somebody like me. You know, nobody ever asked him that question. Who will, who will look at the ayah and say, look at the chicken? So anyway, <laughs> they are all very, very, respect, very, you know, adab wale ladke hai bichare. So respectful. So he told me, I don't know, I don't know what you are So I said, tumne kya padha? I said, what did you read? So he read the ayah. I said, what does it mean? He said, pata nahi. This is our, these are the other fate of ours. We teach the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without knowing the meaning. So anyway, I explained the meaning to him. So I said, he said, ah, ji, samaj So I said, ab kya I said, look at the chicken. What do you understand? He still didn't understand. So I told him, I said, let me ask you a question. That chicken, what does it eat? So he, he said, it eats insects and, and so on. I said, uh, supposing there's a small lizard, you know, chipkali. He said, will it eat? He said, it will eat it. So I said, supposing you eat the chipkali, what will happen? If you eat the lizard, what will happen to you? He said, I will die. It's poisonous. I said, I agree. I said, but if you eat the chicken which ate the lizard, what will happen to you? He said, nothing. I said, now look at the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Kul siru fil ardi fanduru kaifa wada al khalq. Ab samaj mein aya kuch? Woh lalka wada, ah. He said, mayne aisa socha hi ni. He said, I never, I never thought of this. Said, How will he think? Because we don't teach. How will he think? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ How many times when we have been reading the Quran or when we are teaching our students, how many times do you stop them there and say, now what is happening to your heart just now? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, verily the moment is the one who when the zikr of Allah comes before him, his heart will shiver with the fear and majesty and grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you stop him there and say, what are you talking about in Abhi aapne padha na, kuch asar hua dil ke upar. You just read this ayah, what, what is the effect on your heart? Did, we, did Do we ever ask this question? Has ever, anyone ever asked us this question? And my question is, why not? Why not? There is no connection. There is no connection with the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We read the Quran for sawab, alhamdulillah, inshallah, we will get sawab. There is no denying that. But Allah did not send the kalam for sawab. Allah sent, this is the kalam, this is the living kalam, this is the kalam which is live because it is the kalam, it is the speech of Al-Hayyul Qayyum. La ta'khuduhu sinatu wa la naum. But what is our connection with that? That is what I mean by teach them natural laws. Teach them science in this way. Integrated teaching. And that's why I'm saying show, not tell, not lectures. Show them, demonstrate them. And the last one, give them three things. Give them Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalaluhu the connection with Allah and teach them how to take from the treasures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Umar bin Abdul Aziz rahmatullah is dying. Last moments of his life. His, his um, uh, daughters are with him. His brother-in-law, Al-Walid bin Marwan, he comes in and he says, you have impoverished your family. You have turned them all into fuqara, into fakirs. He said, these girls are my mahram. I am their mamu, I am their, I am their uncle. Right? They are like my daughters. Permit me, give me the permission, I will give each of them 100,000 gold dinars. Don't leave them like this. What does Umar bin Abdul Aziz, what does he say? He says to Al-Walid bin Marwan, go away. My children don't need you. I have taught them to take from the treasures of Allah. When they need, they will ask and he will give. Humme se kaun hai jo bol sakta hai? Allah to hoi na bhai. Which one of us can say this? My father Rahmatullah alayhi. I always remember him for these things. Whenever I needed anything, my me and my brother and all that, whenever we needed anything, anywhere we were in the world, we would phone him. And we would say, this is what we need, please make dua for us. 
and i always remember his words he used to say ho jayega ha he used to say mai pakad lunga chhodunga nahi jab tak dega nahi he said i will hold him and i will not leave him until he gives it ha bhai ye taluk kahan se laenge bhai where will we get this taluk from give them allah this is what we have we did not come the nabi did not come to teach us how to do better agriculture or how to do better animal husbandry or you know how to build factories the nabi came to connect the abd to the rabb the purpose of the base of the muhammad or rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is to connect the abd to the rabb and that is our job our job as muslims this is our usp this is the unique thing which we have which nobody else has science and technology others have we should also have other things they have what they don't have is they do not know their rab now we if we are also those who do not know our rab then where do we go from here tell me second one give them criteria to decide give them ethics and morals materialism is not a sufficient criterion to decide you need ethics and morals and then only this is in order of priority only then teach them the tools <coughs> teach them literacy teach them math teach them money art what not what not what not but only after you have introduced to them to allah subhanahu wa taala now this is not my theory This is what the Quran Al Karim teaches us about how to teach about education. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala said in Surah Al Imran, "Aaud billahi min al-Shaytan al-Rajim, Bismillahi r-Rahman r-Rahim. Inna fi khalq al-Samawati wal-Ardi wa ikhtilaf al-Layl wal-Nahar la'ayat liul al-Bab." الذين يذكرون الله قياما وقعودا وعلى جنوبهم ويتفكرون ويتفكرون في خلق السماوات والارض ربنا ما خلقت هذا باطلا سبحانك سبحانك فقنا عذاب النار Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala said verily in the creation of the heavens and the earth and in the alternation of the day and night there are signs for people of intelligence for ulil alba people of understanding and then Allah described who those people are Allah said these are the people and see the order Allah said these are the people who remember Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala standing sitting and lying down what is the meaning of remembering Allah remembering Allah is taqwa remembering Allah is to take Allah into consideration in every aspect of our lives Nobody can say I remember Allah and I am committing haram. No. Nabi صلى الله عليه وسلم said, "Whether Zani is doing zina, his iman has left him." Remembering Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is to know Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala Jalla Jalla Hu and to take Him and His orders into consideration in every aspect of our lives. <coughs> and the beauty of the Bayan of the Quran, Kiyaman wa Qodan wa Ala Junubi Him, takes care of every aspect of human life, standing, sitting, and lying down. and then please notice i'm talking about the criterion allah did not say au yatafakkarun allah said wa yatafakkarun allah did not say intelligent people are those who know this or this no allah said intelligent people are those who first know their rab first wa yatafakkarun and then they make fikr in the khalq of the samawat wal ard what is the meaning of fikr fi khalqi samawati wal ard it is everything that you can imagine which goes under the name of discovery which goes under the name of research which goes under the name of science and technology everything together the beauty of the bayan of allah subhanahu wa taala jalla jalalu he he takes all of our knowledge and puts it into one word wa yatafakkaruna fi khalq samawati wal ard this sequence is the sequence taught in the quran unfortunately we have separated we have fractured it and see the beauty of this what is the result if you approach education in this way first recognize your rab then look at the creation what is the automatic result rabbana ma khalaqta hadha batilan subhanak 
Oh Allah, you have not created this in vain. This world is not an accident. Did not just happen like that. There is a purpose. There is an intelligent creator behind this. And he created it for a purpose. Rabbana ma khalaqta hadha baatila. Subhanaka faqina adhaban nar. Automatically he goes to the akhirah. Oh Allah, we will one day meet you. Ya Allah, save us from the hellfire. Allahumma ajirna min al-nar. Amin ya azal jalali wa likram. This is the beauty of educating in the integrated fashion according to the methodology of education which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Jalla Jalaluhu taught us. My brothers and sisters, we came into this world to give to the people we did not come to take. We have, we have turned it on its head. We are running around behind things just like everybody else. We didn't come to, that is why the world does not like you. Believe me, everyone likes those who give. Nobody likes those who take. That is our problem today. We have become people who are taking so nobody loves us. Values must be inculcated. They cannot be legislated. You cannot say from tomorrow onwards you will speak the truth. No, we have to demonstrate that. And that's why I'm saying it is not how much you know, but how much you do, which makes the critical difference. My brothers and sisters, the last slide, there are two kinds of people in the world. Those who look for ways to succeed and those who tell you why they could not succeed. It's our choice which one we want to be because people will remember us not by what we consumed but by what we contributed. Just think about the people who we today think about, think and talk with great honor and respect. Not because of what kind of house they lived in or which palace or how much money they had. No, but because of what we got from them. <coughs> the uh, question here, I tell my child about Janna Vannar, she is 5 years old, she asked me when will we enter Janna, I could not mention death because it is scary and it is a natural law how to tell them. Now again, see this whole issue of scary, it is not scary, T talk, about, talk about death in the sense of that, you know one very nice uh, word that we use in Urdu is, 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 is explains, we say intakal, intakal ke ka muntakil hona, to from one place to another place. So talk about the Alawal, uh, talk about the Alawal Barzakh, talk about going from one state of being to another state of being and so on. So explain to them, inshallah. So death is not destruction. Death is, uh, is, is the door that opens for us to go into another uh, way of living. Uh, the, alam, the life in Alawal Barzakh is also life. Uh, so therefore talk in terms of that, inshallah. Uh, you can explain that. There is a, if you go to that, um, uh, my YouTube uh, M. Yavarbek channel, uh, there are lectures on all of these things, so you can, inshallah, I mean, I don't know, I don't know whether your five-year-old child will listen, will understand the whole lecture, but you can listen to the lecture and explain, inshallah, from that. Best way to introduce my three-year-old child to Islamic education. I think this is a, Jazakallah Khair, I think very good, uh, you know, to know that people are interested and definitely uh, from what uh, yesterday I was uh, uh, I was listening to the ulama yesterday and they were telling me about various initiatives that are happening here for Islamic education. You should do that. I mean, start, start uh, Islamic primary schools, Makatib and so on. Already some things are happening and more should be strengthened. One thing I think definitely you need in, uh, in Scotland is a, is a full-fledged Darul Uloom. I hope, uh, you know, somebody will actually create that. It's a very big need. And also you need a, a very good uh, Islamic school, inshallah. So eventually it will come, but starting from, uh, you know, at the earliest age possible. For three years old, five years old and so on, the best source of Islamic education is the mother. There is no one which can go which is better than the mother. So the mother is the number one best source. So do that. You use your own, uh, your, your own capability as a mother to introduce the child. Just to give you an example. For example, take the child into the park. Uh, tell the child, go find me some leaves. So the child will bring some leaves. And you say, okay, here is a leaf and uh, here is another leaf. So this is a leaf of, uh, say, a mango tree. Of course, you won't have mango trees here, but whatever trees you have, maple trees. Um, and here is a leaf of some other tree. And then explain to them, okay, here is a leaf. All the trees on the maple tree, the leaves look like this, but do they look exactly like this? They don't look exactly like. So see the, see the Qudrat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how he creates something where they are all maple leaves because they generally look like this, but each one is individual. Each one is different. So in many, many different ways, uh, you know, my, I remember one of my earliest memories, uh, my father used to be in a place uh, in, in uh, India, in Mysore, uh, which was very forested. I remember my mother, uh, I must have been maybe two years old or something, uh, taking me out in the night 
uh, when there was a full moon and showing me the moon and saying, see that is the moon. And we do not worship the moon. We create, we worship the creator of the moon. This is this is the moon. So I mean different ways. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one of the Sahaba they came to him, they said, Ya Rasulullah, will we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Yes, you will see your Rabb. So they said, How will we see our Rabb? Because there will be this huge hujum, the enormous crowd of people. In this whole crowd, I will be one person sitting somewhere in some corner. How will I see my Rabb? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Do you see the full moon? And do you see the sun without any problem? They said, Yes. He said, You will see your Rabb like that. And that's why whenever I see the full moon, I always remember the hadith and I say, Allah, you told us the hadith and you are Rabbul Alameen and you never do anything halfway. So, aapne sunaya, aap humko dikhaiye, inshallah. It's very important for our people, especially our ulama, to actually study science. You cannot answer. See, take, take Imam Al-Ghazali, his whole work, Ya Ulum, uh, was, was really an answer to the problems that philosophy created in those days. And he did that because he understood that philosophy. You obviously, by definition, you cannot answer something that you don't understand yourself. So it is very important, especially for our ulama, young uh, graduates from Darul Ulums, to go and study science. It's very important. We must make this, fund them, give them the money to do that. Don't leave it to them and say, Aap jake padke You have to pay them. Somebody has to pay them. So that is a, it's, it's, a, it's a job of our community. We must do that. And those of us who have studied, it's our job to at least study. I'm not saying necessarily that you have to become Hafiz Quran or become a Mufti, but at least study enough to be able to answer these questions. But definitely it has to be done. I completely agree with you. There are answers to all of this, including, for example, let me take this issue of, of, evolu of uh, evolution. Uh, the West, leave aside God, Darwin's theory has been disproved in the West itself. So there is no need even to go anywhere to, into theology to, prove, to disprove that. But we don't, we don't read the stuff. We don't read the alternate theories of, of evolution. So we are, we, we, you know, and, and the West is promote, has promoted uh, Darwin as if he is the only one who talked about that. That is not true. There, there are other people who also did research and they came to different conclusions. And the issue of evolution and the issue of natural selection, two different things. As far as natural selection is concerned, we've got no problem theologically with that. Our problem is with changing of species, of, of, of actual evolution of species. And for evolution of species, Darwin has no proof. That is his theory, that is, that is conjecture that he based on something. Now, why must you or I be forced to accept somebody's conjecture? There's no proof to that. So, I think these things have to be responded to in their language. Not, not by language, I don't mean English. I mean, I mean in scientific language. We have to respond to them. And we say, I've got absolutely no problem with believing something which has evidence. There is a difference between evidence and conjecture. Don't, don't bring conjecture to me as evidence. Conjecture is not evidence. Conjecture is conjecture. I want evidence. Get me evidence. I will believe it. No problem. So what do you have against the theory of Darwin? Absolutely nothing. We have nothing against anybody's theory. We are very happy to accept the theory as theory. It's not fact. Take for Now, our problem also is, we pick and choose. For example, we say the Big Bang theory. And say, see, the Quran says this. But the reality is, the Big Bang is a theory. Nobody was there to see it. The Quran does not say Big Bang. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described creation the way he created it. Wallah alam, we don't go beyond that description. It's not our job to explain that. If Allah wanted to explain, He would have explained. And very, very good dalail in the Quran for this. People came and asked Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what is the ruh? What is the reply of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala? Yes, alona ka ani ruh. They're asking you, what is the ruh? Kul ar ruhu min amri rabbi. Ab isme kya baat palle padi bhai? What did you understand by this? Allah says, tell them the row is the amor of, of your Rabb. So, <laughs> I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the question is still there. I, I don't know, understand what, what is the meaning of amor of the Rabb. So, point is, if Allah wanted to explain, He would have explained. So, this is what we have to explain to people. That as far as we are concerned, whether it is evolution, whether it is anything, get us facts. We are more than happy to accept facts. But if you bring a theory... And you tell me this is fact, 
then I'm sorry, that, that doesn't work because that is not fact. It's a theory. As a theory, absolutely no problem. I am willing to accept any theory as a theory. But it's not fact. And therefore, we also should be very clear what we use and how we use it. So, if we, if we take a theory and use it within quotes to prove this and that, then we, then we cannot tell somebody, don't bring a theory because he will say, you took my theory and you are proving something now. I wonder if I'll be good today <laughs>